Let's get out, get out, get out. They don't know where our fate lies. That black is black is black is black. Again, this is Bro Diallo broadcasting live, straight out of the sanctuary hypocrisy that is the city of Chirac, state of Drillinois. Good morning, everyone. It is 7.15 on the a.m., the year of your Lord, 2019, early January. We free, y'all. The government is shut down. That means we's free because the Emancipation Proclamation, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment is no longer active. The enforcement can no longer be carried out. When black people were freed from individual ownership of individual white citizens and black people became wards of the state, the federal government, we went from a position of individual ownership to collective ownership. So all intents and purposes, Trump done freed us. Trump is the brand new Martin Luther the King, not Martin Luther the King, but he's a brand new Abraham the Lincoln. Glory, y'all. Glory. We don't even realize that. If you are a black man or a black woman in a federal penitentiary, just walk right on out. Tell them the government shut down. How can you enforce your rule? How can you enforce the oppression. How can you enforce my bondage? Ain't no more government. If you are a black man or a black woman in the U.S. Armed Services, drop your weapon. Stop killing them Arabs. Stop killing them Africans. Stop killing them Asians. Stop occupying the lands of foreign folks who ain't never done nothing to or about you. Stop carrying, stop being fodder for the U.S. empire. Stop generating profits for private U.S. corporations in the name of spreading democracy. Drop your weapon, U.S. soldier, black especially. Strip off that flag off your shoulder and tell your ranking officer to kiss your black ass because the government is no more. It is shut down. Walk. Get to stepping. If you are a federal agent, are you some bootlicking? butt kissing, shuffling, buck dancing, Uncle Tom, handkerchief, head, Negro. Stop spying. Stop reporting back to the NSA, the FBI, the CIA, the BATF, all you Uncle Tom snitches, all you black spies, all you infiltrator and agent provocateurs, cut it out. The government is done. It's shut down. So you can stop undermining black power, undermining black organizations, undermining black sovereignty, undermining black empowerment, undermining black determination. You can cut it out. You can stop spying. That goes for you, those based in the USA, you COINTELPRO agents, and you foreign agents in Africa, in the Caribbean, in Central and South America, in parts of Asia where there's enough black folks. In the Hawaiian Islands, the Pacific Islands, New Zealand, Aboriginal, all you agents of empire, all you spy CIA assets, cut it out. The government is done. The empire is over until it's on again. So we could at least take a little break. Come on, y'all. Celebrate with me. Or, or, is there something else going on here? Because if the government shut down, we get all of the liabilities, all of the pain of a federal government shutdown, and none of the benefits. Because this is what white folks love to do. And I know y'all hate hearing white. I know white folks. The worst words you could ever spit in the ear of a white person is white people. They hate hearing that word. They love being that thing, but they hate hearing it. They love what it is, but they hate what when it's called out. Is there something else here? Because I know the federal government, white folks, love to impose dependency. They love to make you dependent and then shame, mock, and harm you because of your dependency. They undermine black economic independence, black economic self-determination. They impose a forced, false dependency of black people on the apparatus of the state, and then they turn around and complain we got all these black people wanting stuff. We got African nations that want foreign aid. And we got black people who want welfare. No, you had black nations that wanted their independence. You had black people that were well on their way to economic sovereignty. 
and then you, the federal government, in, in, in collusion with private and other public agencies, subverted black people, rendered us dependent, and then mock and shame and attack us for dependency. Just like when white folks love to say, if you don't like America, leave. They love to say, get out my country. But there have been at least a half a dozen well-organized repatriation organizations, black organizations, back to Africa movements. And every single time black people organize a back to Africa movement, every single time black people organize a repatriation movement, the OSS, the CIA, the FBI, the NSA, and all the other unknown, unannounced intelligence agencies undermine. They assassinate or exile the leaders. They cut, choke off the funding and stop us from leaving. You don't want us to stay. You won't let us leave. They hate to say all these asshole countries. Always America's over here saving everybody. America's sending uh, uh, aid and all these foreigners coming to our country and all our American tax dollars going to prop up these countries. When all these countries have said, listen, if you don't want my citizens coming to your country and you don't want to have to send aid, I tell you what, let's cut off all contact. We'll stop sending our resources to you and we'll stop sending our citizens to you and you stop sending your military to our shores. You stop with your damn submarines and your aircraft carriers. You leave us alone, we will leave you alone. Is that a bet? So something ain't making sense, something ain't smelling right. White folks love to create conditions that they then turn around and complain about. They love to create conditions that they turn around and blame other people for. That's why I say all the white people's wounds, all the white people's problems are self-inflicted and they could solve them, but they love it. They love this dysfunction. They love this turmoil. They love this strife. So the government shutdown is yet another hustle. And there's another angle for this. White folks is doing in plain sight what they've been talking about they're doing. Now I know some white people are like, I don't support Trump. I don't support the government. I don't support the empire. Yes, you do. If you, you listen, passivity is cooperation. One of the good white people, Howard Zinn, said you can't be neutral along, on a speeding train. So your lack of revolutionary resistance is a tacit uh, approval. So yes, it is you, unless it ain't you. And it is you if you're not actively fighting against it. Simply holding a opinion. Like, I don't agree. I'm not voting for Trump is not resistance. Not agreeing with the government's doing is not resistance. Feeling some sympathy or sorrow for what the colored folks go through is not resistance. That's all in your head. While you're still walking on tulips and, and drinking the manna from heaven. Or eating the manna from heaven. Is manna, is manna solid or liquid? I guess it depends on what video, fantasy video game you're playing. But I digress. Government ain't shut down. All of the essential elements of the government, which means the essential elements of empire, the, 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 the damn financial services, the U.S. military, which is the biggest, most well-funded aspect of the federal government, is still going. It's just the government aspects that serves the people, the few elements of government that actually serve the people, the public parks, the public museums, the low-paid federal workers of the TSA who are mostly black folks, but the elements of the federal government that are involved locking us up, surveilling us, suppressing and repressing us, the elements of the government that involve mass murder, mass oppression, they ain't called home, not one, nary one aircraft carrier. Those aircraft carriers, those Trident submarines, those nuclear armed submarines that could kill a whole continent, millions of people in seconds, that can sneak up on your shores of any sovereign country and obliterate that country, they ain't called one back to port. Now I won. How many aircraft, do you know how many millions of dollars an hour, not a day, not a month, not a year, how many millions of dollars an hour it takes to maintain the U.S. 
Imperial fleet. All of these drones and manned aircraft, stealth bombers. The nuclear triangle. The United States says we want to be able to launch a water, land, and space nuclear attack anywhere in the world in under two minutes. So 24 hours a day, the U.S. has land-based nukes, uh, ocean-based nukes, and air and upper atmosphere-based nukes. And the Space Force, and, and, and remember Star Wars under Ronald Reagan, and now Space Force under uh, Donald. I'm not calling him Trump. I'm not calling him president. I'm calling his ass Donald. That's a real name of a goofy cartoon character. His name is Donald. Donald wants to start a space force. Ain't none of that been shut down. Ain't one of those genocidal boats, genocidal air, uh, airplanes, genocidal submarines been called back to port. So this government shutdown is not about shutting down the government. It's about shutting down the working class people. It's about shutting down the, the, the lower ranking elements. The libertarian, the ultra right wing uh, Republicans, the funders, the global billionaire class, they don't want a functional government. They would love for this uh, country, to the, 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 for the country to, to, to destroy the democracy, the elements of democracy. And this isn't really a democracy, it's a republic. It's a nation of laws, not a nation of power. But I, I mean, I can't get into basic civics. I'm, I should. But I ain't got that kind of time. I used to have three hours on Friday. I only got two. What do you want from me? But, and, and I got to get to my actual topic. I'm sick of y'all cussing me out. Talking about I don't get to the point. Every point is the point. It's a thousand points. I'm going to tell you like George Bush told y'all before he died. There are a thousand points of light. <laughs> There's a thousand points. Man, there ain't one point to this. It's a whole big conspiracy. All things are connected. So if I'm talking about one thing, I'm talking about air thing. Let's get that out the way right now so y'all can stop harassing me, hurting my self-esteem. But I digress. The Republicans, the right wing, the fascist, the libertarian, neo-Nazi. And let me just say this before I get back to what they really want to do with this shutdown. Neo-Nazi is the wrong thing to... White racist Americans can't be neo-Nazis because they predate the Nazis. The Nazis should be called neo-Americans. Real talk. Go back to Mein Kampf. Go back to Goebbels and all oh, they said it with their own words. Go look at Project Paperclip. Google it. The Nazis were mimicking the Americans. The Americans are not mimicking the Nazis because the Americans were engaged in genocide and global military conquest long before the Nazis came and long after the Nazis left. So white people can't be neo-Nazis, even if they fly in swastikas. There have been more ethnic, religious, racial minorities murdered, slaughtered, genocide, enslaved, occupied by the U.S. flag. If you're offended by the swastika, but you're not offended by the, the, the old red, white, and blue, then you have a warped sense of history and reality. In fact, if you're offended by the Confederate flag, black people spent less than a decade. Now look at the timeline. Black people spent less than a decade enslaved under the Confederate flag. We spent over 200 years in bondage and another century and legalized racial segregation under the red, white, and blue. So if you want to be offended by symbols based on the level of racism, oppression, mass murder, genocide, imperialism, you should hate the American flag more than you hate the swastika and the Confederate flag. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe did America apologize? I think America did apologize for slavery, so it's all, you know, they didn't give us no reparations, and they have not ceased and desisted in oppression. They still got millions of black people and some white folks in legal slavery in the U.S. state, federal, county, prison system. Every incarcerated person on the planet is legit a slave, according to the U.S. Constitution. 
So they still got slaves. They still mass murdering. And now they're they not content with just mass murdering people. They kill an entire ecosystem. They kill an entire animal species. So they apologize while they were in the midst of still doing what they do. So I, I've never understood this whole neo-Nazi thing where Americans, I think it let, uh, lets America off the hook to call racist Americans Nazis. You should call racist Germans Americans. But I digress. The right wing of America for decades have been wanting to do away with certain aspects of the federal government that provide direct services and empowerment to the people. They want to shrink government down to a size where it can be drowned in the bathtub. And the reason they want to do that is because the private industries, multinational corporations have grown to such an extent that the only way that citizens, individual people, can challenge the might and power and influence and profits of multinational corporation is through using our majority numbers. We outnumber the elite. We have less money, we have less power, we have fewer guns, we have fewer goons to kill for us. The only thing we have is raw numbers. And so if the democratic elements of the federal government are active, are functional, Black people have, not just blacks, but working class people. We, we in transcended race. We're being post-racial for this segment of the show. And we're going transracial. We're going, we're going to talk about class. I'm going to get in trouble for saying all that, but I must continue. The working class element, the 99% in the United States have an enormous weapon at their disposal called the apparatus of the state. The U.S. Congress, if you really look at the Constitution, the most powerful entity in the United States is the Congress, the House and Senate. They can bypass the president. They can render the, the Supreme Court null and void. And that is a democratic body. You have the House and the Senate, hundreds of senators, a hundred, uh, I mean, one hundred senators, hundreds upon hundreds, almost three hundred, and counting over four. Man, I don't even. I lost count because they always, every time they do a census, they have to create new districts. But anyway, hundreds upon hundreds of congressmen and women, and one hundred senators that have constitutionally the power to bypass, to override the president and bypass the Supreme Court, if they so desire. And so, the corporation says, the last tool they have it there, because it used to be a combination of weapons that the working class people could garner against the elites. Unions, sit-down strikes, wildcat strikes. Unions. Unions were, were not government, non-governmental organizations. And there was a time where it was approaching um, over 40% of all workers were unionized. But really, when you have about between 35 to 40% of workers being unionized, that pretty much means the entire society is unionized. Because no companies, all companies, if you go back and study labor history, all companies have to bring all workers to the basic level of the, of the union. That's why a lot of non-unionized companies have a deep investment in unionized companies and what they can negotiate with their workers. And a lot of times, non-union jobs give more benefits and pay more money to their workers in order to convince them, to manipulate them not to form a union. So even though the unions are only represent, unions essentially represent all workers because the unions, what they do is create the baseline. They create the floor that no other workers can fall beneath. And then you have a lot of stupid workers who work at a non-union job, which this happened to me. Uh, when I finished uh, x-ray school, when I was working as a, a radiologic technologist, an x-ray tech, I went to work, I wanted to be a member of the union. I had studied union history, I'd read it, and I always wanted to be a member of a union. Well, y'all aspire to be stars, and y'all aspire to be famous. Y'all 
aspire to ball out. Y'all aspire to transcend spiritual, the earthly plane into a higher existence. All the things, all I ever wanted to be as a child was a union, a card-carrying union member. Because to me, that was the closest thing I could get to socialism in America. And I've always been a socialist. Not always. Since I was 12 to 14, I was always a socialist. So I wanted to be a union man. So I went and joined the 1199 union. The, which was a, a union for healthcare workers. And I'd go to the union meeting hall. I had me a union pin. It was just, but I, I peaked in my early 20s. I'd live, I've already reached my dreams. I could, you know, I could die tomorrow. I'm, I'm done. I've done all that I wanted. <laughs> Let me stop front. But I really didn't want to be a union member. And I worked at it and I found out one thing that really disappointed me about being a member of the union is that all the thing they focused on was job security and pay raises. That whole, all other elements of the union had pretty much eroded. See, I thought I was going to be a wobbly international workers of the world unite. All I had to lose was my chain. I thought I was going to be a part, but that was my fault reading all that Howard Zinn propaganda. But I'm like, fine, better than nothing. I went ahead and did my union thing, but one thing I found were all these people that were ignorant of the union and they were very discontent with the union. And everything they knew about the union, even though they were members of the union, everything they knew and understand about labor union came from the corporate press, which was anti-union because it was owned by the elites who hate unions, who hate, they don't, the elites don't hate unions, they hate the working class. The elites, rich people hate working class and poor people, they hate us and we admire and love and aspire to be them. It's a really sick relationship. But let me, I'm gonna try to wrap this up. But anyway, I had this one woman who was also a union member and she would sit there and talk about how her sister, her and her sister were both techs. And she would talk about how her sister worked at a proprietary hospital, which was a privately owned for-profit, which was uncommon in the early nineties, believe it or not. And she talked about how well her sister was paid and how the benefits that her sister got and how her sister wasn't part of a union and her life was so much better. And she didn't understand why these non-union workers were living so fat off of the struggle, sacrifice, and resistance of the union. And I went to my uh, union delegate. I used to call him delegate. It was a Puerto Rican guy. He was a union man like me. He was a true believer. But I used to piss him off because I call him my union delicate. And you know, I don't know if you know, if you know a Puerto Rican dude, they, they machismo and all that. Blah, blah, blah. So they, they, they're tough guys, you know? So I used to call him my union delicate. <laughs> and that made it. And I, if it didn't make you mad, I wouldn't call him that. But anyway, I went to my union delicate. And I'm like, every time you bring all the, the us together, all you want to talk about is our benefits, job security, and benefits. Job security, benefits, scheduled pay raises. I said, you never talk about labor history. You never talk about worker empowerment. You never talk about worker governance, worker control. You never talk about seizing the means of production. You don't talk about any of these other elements, the main elements of unionization. You just talk about the payoff. He's like, yeah, you're right. And I'm like... If you don't educate the people, the very people that the union benefits are going to turn against the union and so on and so forth. But anyway, back to, to, to the topic at hand. I think unions, I think all citizens, all working class people, if you are less worth less than $5 million, if you earn more money from your direct labor than you earn from dividends or from your investments and holdings, if you are a member of the working class, you should know labor history. But I continue to digress. The elites want to destroy. So the black, so the black, I'm sorry, transracial, the working class people of America had a very solid presence. And the unions, we would pool our resources together. So we would use our numbers, the unwashed hordes of the poor and the working class would pull our resources together and the labor unions would fund an oppositional uh, policies and oppositional poli uh, uh, politicians that would stand and be a wall against the 
elites. And yes, labor unions were racist as hell, but so are the elites. Everything is racist. The water in America is racist. The air in America is racist. That's just a, that's a given. The atoms, the molecules in America are racist. That just ain't no way around that. That's a whole nother discussion. So yes, the labor union is racist as hell, but that don't mean we can't recount and understand and use the, it's still, the analysis is the analysis, the facts are the facts. And black people think if it's racist, we don't have to study it. If it's racist, we don't have to look at it. If it's racist, we don't have to understand it. We do that to our detriment. So let's proceed. And the labor unions were one of the major funders of the Democratic Party up until Bill Clinton came to office in 1992. And Bill Clinton was like, yeah, this labor union money is nice, but when, we, when the labor unions were funding, and another thing was the civil litigators. And then you see, if you look at everything you've been taught to hate in life, it's generally the things that are best for you. You hate Brussels sprouts and you love Big Macs. Everything you've taught, Brussels sprouts are better for you than Big Macs. So people tend to hate unions. The unions are corrupt, and you turn on the TV, and you look at the mafia movies, and all you see is these corrupt unions, corrupt. And then you never see movies that show the real hierarchy and power structure. You know, they show the businessman as some hardworking guy that's willing to sacrifice and stay up night, and while we're all partying and dancing, he's sitting in a cold, hard basement trying to invent something and being innovative and forward-thinking. You know, or they show rich people like the, the Arthur movies being hapless and just, oh, we're just the auto rich, we're up there, we're so dumb. And we laugh at, the, oh, look at that rich idiot while they're ruling our lives and our children's and our grandchildren's lives. So it's all propaganda. People hate unions. People don't know damn thing about the unions, how the unions came to be, how the unions sustain, or what the unions have done. And then you look at uh, the, the litigation lawyers, the ambulance chasers class action lawyers. A lot of the lawyers who were also big political donors to the Democrats like the unions, these were people that would hold multinational corporations to account. The, the people that got the billion dollars from the cigarettes, the people who got the billions of dollars from DuPont and that are suing all these big companies. And so the elites hate these litigation lawyers. That's why whenever you look at the corporate media, all these slimy lawyers, these sleazy lawyers, but it's only one segment of the lawyers that are slimy, better call Saul, sleazy lawyers that are Weasley lawyers. Now the high power corporate lawyers, the high power uh, 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 political lobbyists, you don't see them. It's these, you know, call 1-800-LAW. These TV lawyers, ambulance chasers. They were another element that the people could use, another tool that the people can manipulate. And like any tool, if it's properly used, it can be very useful. If it's misused, you know, hammer, you can smash your finger or you can build a house. And you know, there's risk involved. I'm not saying these were perfect tools. I'm not saying these are righteous tools. I'm just saying historically, these are things that working class people who didn't have the money, who didn't have the power, who couldn't feel paid goons to come and smash the head, and one of my favorite lines from any rap song was when uh, Boots Riley said, I never seen the police break a strike by hitting the boss with his baton pipe. Let me say that again. I never seen the police break a strike by hitting the boss with his baton pipe. So you have a strike. You have a 10,000 workers and one boss and one CEO. And you would think there's a labor dispute between 10,000 workers and one CEO. And this is a democracy. 10,000 is more than one. And you would think if the people who want to keep the peace, the police, the National Guard says, well, we're here to keep the peace. Now, what's a more rational way to keep the peace? Go up there and beat the hell out of and clash with 10,000 workers? Or go get that one CMO and tell him to chickety check himself. Hit him in the head. And say, whatever you one person did to piss off these 10,000 people, you better fix it. Or we're going to kick your ass. And we can send one person to kick your ass, or we can send a whole troop to have to fight these people in the streets. And they always choose to beat up the people in the street than beat up the one guy in the big front office. Inefficient. 
Why? Because they're paid goons. And they don't even understand, well, the only reason I need to be, the only reason I'm paid by this person is because this person is robbing those people. And if I stopped this person from robbing those people, he wouldn't have the money to pay me to rob them. But if I did, I, you know, if I stop allowing the individual to rob the masses, then the masses would be able to spread the wealth amongst us equitably. And even though I might not have as much as I had before, I would have other beneficial things like a just society, like a clean environment, like a real sense of self. Like, you know, a lot of these cops and soldiers commit suicide, have alcoholism and, and spousal abuse because we are primates. And so we do feel this connection, some of us, unless they're absolute psychopaths, and then there's nothing we can do with them anyway. It's all connected. Didn't I tell you everything, thousand points of light, all things are connected. So they want to do away. They did away with the unions. George W. Bush, it started with Trump. I mean, not Trump. It started with uh, Bill Clinton. And then they started to, uh, to, to target the civil leg litigators. They wanted the civil litigators. They wanted the ambulance chasers because the citizens would, could sometimes rally and pull our resources together and get these, these slimy lawyers to go at these big companies, to go at these elites and hold them to account. So George W. Bush finally put a cap on the civil litigation and made it much harder to bring class action lawsuits. So that's another element of people power. Another element of people power was just burn, burn it all down, rioting. And that's when they put in the mass surveillance system. They kill these movements before they grow. And it ain't just Republicans. Remember, the biggest social justice movement we had in recent history was not Black Lives Matter. It was the Occupy movement. And the Occupy movement was branching out into Occupy the Hood. And every segment of the society was getting their own specific ask within the larger Occupy movement. And it was Barack Hussein Obama that systematically underpinned the Occupy movement. So... With the mass surveillance apparatus, they have been able to subvert mass movements. So we don't have our mass movements. We don't have our sleazy lawyers. We don't have our labor unions. But one thing we had was our vote. And we had the, the ability to bring about legislation. See, a lot of times when you can't get something through uh, in the streets, you run to the courts. You can't get it in the courts, you run to the ballot box. You don't get it in the ballot box, you take it to the streets. You know, and that's how the citizens are gone. If you look, I mean, again, I'm going back to Howard Zinn a lot because I think he laid it out, but there's other people that laid it out better. But, you know, since we're being transracial, the People's History of the United States, it's really a good book that, that really harps on these points that I'm making, the traditional elements of power. But anyway, the government shut down. It's not shutting down. None of the services, none of the federal structures that go to support and aid multinational corporations, the U.S. empire, the weapons corp contractors, the overseas suppliers, shipping companies, all the shipping lanes are still protected because the U.S. military really shut down. Walmart couldn't get all those cheap, disgusting goods to you. All those uh, family dollar, Dollar Tree, couldn't get all those contaminated goods to the hood because Somali pirates and other people would jack that but they are protected by a military and they don't pay no money for that security. The money markets, you know, the secret services deals with counterfeiting and sustains the fiat currency. So all the elements of the federal government that sustain the rich, the whites, the elites, all of the major, the, the uh, tax, the elements of the IRS that facilitate major real estate deals, that facilitate returning money back in. You think you just get the refund check. We got all these memes making fun of poor black folks waiting on a refund check. I ain't seen one meme that talked about the billions of dollars that Apple, trillion dollar corporation, the kickbacks that they get back from the federal government. What are the memes from that? But if people wouldn't know about it, it wouldn't even be funny because things that we find funny are things that we can relate to. But since we're ignorant of corporate welfare, since we're ignorant of the true drains on the system of the real welfare kings it wouldn't we wouldn't find it funny we just think oh that's just that black talk i suppose so this is not a government shutdown 
This is a government rearranging. This is a government reprioritization, reprioritization, reprioritization. This is what they call a bloodless coup d'etat. And black people assume, oh, I don't even know the government don't make no difference on my life because you don't understand the connection. People who think this don't mean nothing to me. Let me tell you something. It means something to you. I wish it. I wish black people were wholly and fully independent of the federal government. Like when, when these idiots, these demagogues like Dr. Umar, when these demagogues, cult leaders like Farrakhan tell black people don't vote. Here's the thing. I seek to be fully independent and sovereign and independent of the federal government, of U.S., of all white control, all white oppression, all white domination over my life. But the one way to never get free is to deny that you're oppressed or to deny your dependency or deny how integrated and interconnected black people are with the state, with the economy. You don't deny it. You can't fix something by denying it. It's like when a woman is in an abusive relationship with a man and denying that she's in the relationship will not fix it. It's like, isn't that your man? No, that ain't my man. Don't y'all live together? Yes. Don't y'all have children together? Yes. Don't you uh, depend on him to pay the bills? Yes. Don't y'all sleep together in the bed at night? Yes. Aren't you currently pregnant with his child? Yes. But I don't acknowledge that. I don't claim it. So you are all intertwined and you're just going to deny it. So the way to get out of something is acknowledge it. The way to cure a disease is to acknowledge the disease, to diagnose the disease. The way to get rid of a cancerous tumor is first to acknowledge that the tumor is there. And then you have to also say, well, this tumor is in my lung. And the, the cancer cells are fully integrated and intertwined with the healthy lung cells. So I want to extract the tumor without, number one, killing myself, and in such a way that doesn't leave me vulnerable to, to the return or the, the regrowth of the tumor. So I know a lot of black people like to pretend like they so hood. I don't vote. I don't care nothing about the government. I don't even listen to white people. I don't read no white books. I don't read no white man newspaper. I don't pay no attention to, to nothing white. Oh, oh, oh. That's like the woman in the abusive relationship that just denies that she's fully integrated. You breathing, you know, the, you're eating food that's been inspected, inspected by the federal government. You're driving clothes. I mean, you're driving clothes. You're driving cars that have been inspected. Everywhere you look in that car is a, is a barcode and a seal. Even when you buy a product, you look in that product, there's sometimes a sticker or a label that says on there, inspected by. You're wearing clothes that were allowed into the country or shipped into the country and through a port of entry overseen by the federal government. You're driving on highways maintained and, and governed by the federal highway. Many of y'all are working on companies that are either directly or indirectly funded by federal grants and other set-asides and allocations. And no shame in it. Hell, you're the, the irritated genie, the most militant black man in America, the head of the straight pride movement, the black decency movement. You know, the main man that wants to kill all whiteys. He was a federal government. He was a federal employee. And he had no intentions of quitting that job. And until Fox News found out this black militant was working for the National Security Agency. So, I mean, we, we in this. So what are we going to do? Are we going to surgically remove ourselves? Are we going to do this surgical detachment? Or are we just going to stay stuck and deny that we're stuck? Y'all tell me how y'all want to do it. One way I can work with everybody and we can do this. The other way I just have to sit back and watch y'all. I just can't engage in nothing. There's been enough madness and irrationality in my life. Everything I do from here is going to be informed by rationality and conscious thought. But that's me. So the government shutdown is something we should pay attention to and stop listening to the lies of the corporate media. The corporate media, you know, is, is I mean, just if, if, if you're watching media and in between seg news segments, you see commercials for Kraft cheese or you see commercials for Oldsmobile. If you see corporately sponsored media, take what you read as a gain of salt. Just know more likely than not, 
if they aren't outright lying to you, they're telling you a distorted, manipulated version of the truth. You have to go find you some non-corporate media, like the Bro Diallo show. I ain't toot my own horn. Because if, if Amazon came, you know, this is brought to you by Amazon, Ford Motor Company, GE, we bring good things to light, then I'm telling you, they not gonna let me say the stuff. They not gonna let me say the things I be saying. They not gonna let me address the topics that I address. I ain't even gonna lie, and I'm gonna tell you right now, I, am I gonna take the money? Tom will tell, they not gonna offer the money. But if they did offer the money, would I take the money? Let me tell you right now, hell nah, I like poverty. <laughs> I'll stay down here with y'all. We all struggle together. <laughs> But then again, they ain't offering the money, so let's not even speculate. <laughs> but now nah, I wouldn't take the money. Maybe. <laughs> I'm just saying, I ain't got the money now. So right now, let's just enjoy where we are right now. Okay? Okay? Let's just enjoy where we are right now. We unfunded, we're impoverished, and we're struggling. Let's just enjoy what we have now and not worry about if Amazon or GE or any of these multi that want to come sponsor the Bro Diallo show. But let me tell you something. I definitely wouldn't take the money if I had the support of the people. So get on the Patreon account. Get on there, share. Go subscribe to the YouTube. Show the support. So when Bezos come to the door and say, I want to sponsor your show, boy. And I can say, you get on from around here, Jeff Bezos. I don't need your money. The people support me. And I can say that with all confidence. Moving on to some, some sadder news. <clears throat> um, a judge by the name of a woman, I'm sure she's a feminist, a triumphant woman. This is that mess with feminism. We got women judges. Women judges are no likely, more likely to bring you justice than a man judge because it ain't about the gender, it's about the institution. So women becoming equal to men will make women equal to men, which means women will be able to impose the same level of injustice oppression, discrimination, racism, as men have done. But I digress. Y'all keep fighting that feminist movement. All, I tell y'all, leave integrationist movements alone. Just leave them alone. They don't need you. They got corporate sponsorship. I don't. I need you. Integrationist movements, the feminist movement, don't need no black people. You got Africana womanism, or go make up something else to fight another whole new platform. But anyway, this woman, this empowered woman, who is now, you know, a judge, who is up for election. I think her tenure ends in April. So she'll have to come to the people and ask us if they, if we want to retain her in office. Uh, Demacenia Stevenson. So I suspect, and here's the thing about, if you go Google search this judge, she's been scrubbed from the internet. There are hundreds of circuit, uh, civil, or civic, and, and, and criminal judges all over, just for Cook County alone let alone state of Illinois. Judges everywhere. You can find pictures, you can find biographies, you can find all this info, but this particular judge, she knew, she knew, and I did find, you go to Diallo Kenyatta, my Facebook page, I give you her phone number and her uh, court building, her room. This judge, Dominica A. Stevenson, she's in the uh, Layton Criminal Court Building, room 204. Her phone number is 773-674-7422. That's the direct phone number to her office. Now, let me tell you why her location. She ain't too far. I'm over here in Ukrainian Village. You know, you go due east of where I am. Just a few, but she ain't too far from me right now. What this woman did is there are two former officers and one still officer, Joseph Walsh. Thomas Gaffney and a uh, detective. Those are two basic, you know, beat walkers. And this guy, Detective uh, David March. Those are the three men who tried to cover up and cover for uh, Van Dyke, the man who lynched, who, who, who legally lynched uh, Laquan McDonald. Shot this boy 16 times. Murdered this boy in cold blood. And then the mayor, the reason why the mayor stepped down, because there was a big cover-up. I mean, there's a, way too much information on the uh, Laquin, Laquan McDonald case for me to rehash it. But these three, well, they two former officers, Walsh and uh, <clears throat> March, left the force when this came down. 
But right now, Thomas Gaffney, they got him on death duty. But now with this acquittal, he could be back patrolling our streets. Today, he could be on duty right now. Because he's still on, on the payroll. We're still paying this, this, this uh, accomplice, this criminal, this gangbanger. But Judge uh, Dominica Stevens found them all not guilty. And what they were being charged with was essentially lying under oath and falsifying police reports. Now, if I falsify, I could call the police right now and say my wife put her hands on me. Let's say I want to play a Xbox and eat peanut butter cups. And my wife say, there's work to do and you ain't going to be eating all that. I mean, she's trying to dictate my, what I eat and what I can't eat. Ain't that about something? So I concoct this story to get her off my back so I can do what I want to do and get them to drag, and I lie, and I take a document and say, my wife did these things, and it is later proven and determined that she had not done those things, then she, and she, and I wrote it on it, and then I falsified the police report. They just put somebody in jail. They got this thing called swatting, where people will call the police and say that there's a hostage situation, and then the SWAT team will come to somebody's house, and it's all fake. Not only do you get to go to jail, you have to pay for all the money, all the, 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 the public funds that were put in to mobilize the SWAT team, the man hours and the document and the paperwork. They can find you for all that. So falsifying a police report is serious business. There are people who are being fined and paid thousands of dollars. There are people who are in jail for that. So these three officers, in a statement, before the, 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 the video of the horrendous shooting was released, these three officers stated that. Laquan McDonald had attempted to stab Officer Van Dyke, that he lunged, that he swung the knife at Officer Van Dyke. They stated that Officer Van Dyke, these, and went on record, these three officers stated that Officer Van Dyke had given Laquan McDonald a verbal warning, such as, get down on the ground, drop your weapon, it's the police, and all of that. They also stated that uh, after he was shot the first time, LaQuinn McDonald hit the ground and attempted to get back up, which uh, necessitated Van Dyke pumping over a dozen more bullets into this boy's body because he was raising back up after lunging at him with the knife and being verbally warned. We saw the video. I've seen the video. We all saw the video. If you care to see the video, it's still up on the Internet. These were all false statements. The video shows that Laquan McDonald was moving away from the officer, never lunged at the officer, and Van Dyke unloaded his uh, service revolver on Laquan McDonald as he arrived at the scene without issuing any verbal warning, and there were already cops at the scene who were in no danger from Laquan McDonald. Everything these cops said was fake, which is against the law. Not our laws. We didn't write the laws. They breaking their own law. They pooping in their own cereal bowl. And so with the video evidence, and this was a black woman prosecutor, the sister tried to hold us down to the detriment to her own uh, career. This prosecutor, prosecutors are very dependent. There's a very incestuous relationship between the police and the prosecutor because if the prosecutor wants to prosecute a crime. Where does she get her evidence from? Who does she depend on testimony from? They need the police. It's incestuous. So this black woman prosecutor put her whole career. I'm sure she ain't paid off her student law school loan. I'm sure, damn sure. She's not going to be doing any... This black woman, credit to her, put her name on the line. So you had this black woman here trying to lock these pigs up for breaking the law, not, not lock them up on behalf of black folks, not lock them up for the revolution, but lock them up for disobeying white laws. This was not something being done for black people. They were like, listen, there are many opportunities for you to abuse and even murder black people in these streets and get away with it. And there's just a few ways for you to do it the wrong way. So if you kill us the right way, you get a raise. You become a local right-wing celebrity. You get to be a neo-Nazi hero. <laughs> but if you just violate white laws, there are white laws that allow them to abuse us, to dehumanize us, and there are white laws that say, hey, this is the line you don't cross. And they crossed all the lines. And this judge, looking at the video evidence, just like the judge that, that, that saw 
the jury, it wasn't this was a judge trial, but the jury that looked at the Rodney King tape said, I see no beating here. I see no abuse here. So she said, not guilty. Threw the case out. There's no case here. Yeah, I see that they said Laquan McDonald attempted to stab. They said Van Dyke issued a warning. They said after he was initially shot, he tried to get back up to continue his knife assault against Van Dyke. All proven to be a lie. Written down with their signatures. One officer wrote it. The other two officers said, yeah, that's exactly what I saw with my own damn eyes. This is what they just put Van Dyke away for more than two decades. They just threw the book at Van Dyke for this exact thing. They didn't lock up Van Dyke just for killing Laquan McDonald. They locked up Van Dyke. The people were getting locked up. It became an issue. Rahm Emanuel had to leave office because of the cover-up. The cover-up was the major crime. Cops killing us wholesale. Cops shooting black boys every day. That ain't nothing new, but you don't cover it up. When the white man says, okay, tell me what happened, you can kill blacks, but don't lie to the white daddy. Don't lie to the white judge. Don't lie to the white people in power. Kill blacks, but don't lie to us. Lying to the white man is worse than killing a black man. Lying to a white man in authority. But what Judge Stevenson has done, because Van Dyke's lawyer immediately said after he was found guilty that we're going to appeal this case. So when uh, the uh, case for appeal comes up, Van Dyke has this acquittal. So if these guys aren't guilty, how the hell is Van Dyke guilty when they're found, they were tried and found innocent of covering up a crime? And if they were not guilty of covering up a crime, then there was no crime to cover up. So what she did was open the door to let uh, Laquan McDonald's murderer, Officer Van Dyke, if not walk away scot free, have his sentence greatly reduced. That's the hustle. That's the deal. And they always come. They did the same thing with the Rodney King case. They always come once the heat is off. This is going on five years now. So Dominica Stevenson is up for election. On the, on the uh, April or November ballot of 2019, there will be a question on that ballot. Do you want to retain Judge Dominica Stevens in the uh, criminal courts? Send her ass back to private practice. Send her ass back to civilian life. Register to vote. That's why I'm saying you don't always vote. For freedom. You don't vote for, oh, don't vote Democrat, Republican. This is not a Democrat, Republican issue. Judges are nonpartisan. And guess what? When you get a ballot, you can skip over the parts of the ballot you don't want nothing to do with. You ain't got to vote. You can leave the parts blank. You know what I'm saying? If you're eligible to vote, you know, that's just a small, minute, but necessary little weapon in the people's arsenal. Her tenure is up. In 2019, I believe uh, June 9th, 2019, this 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 fascist judge, and from what little you're able to find on her about it, uh, the uh, on the internet, they say uh, Judge uh, the Messina, uh Dominica Dominica D O M E N I C A Stevenson S T E P H E N S O N Judge Dominica Stevenson. She already had a reputation of being partial to prosecutors and being partial to police. They have scrubbed her. They're working to scrub her from the internet until this blows over. But we have her office, her official office, the criminal court building, Layton Criminal Court Building, room 204. You put that in, in Google Maps, you can go knock on her door and let her know how you feel. You can call her. If you're not in the city of Chicago, I believe they've already organized a protest at the court building and at her office. The protest is already organized for today. Uh, you could also give her a call. If you're not in the city of Chirac, State of Drill, Illinois, you can call 773-674-7422. Flood some phones, y'all. And they're trying to scrub her from the internet. So take this information and pass it around, push it around. And also, you can contact the Chicago Police Department, the CPT, and ask them, why is Officer Thomas Gaffney still on the force? Why is he still drawing a paycheck from the citizens of Chicago? 
Why is he still worthy to be on the force? Why is this liar, this gang banger? The police are a gang, the most dangerous gang. And let me tell you something, white folks. If you don't think that when y'all get hungry from the government shutdown, when, when, the, when the elites drain y'all and finally under and unemploy y'all, when your son stashes his meth and his fentanyl and his heroin in your house and the, squ and, 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 and the uh, task force is kicking down your door, you think that they will treat you better because you white. Just look at Paris. Look at Paris. Let's get her out of office. Let's hold consequences. This is an ongoing conflict. Uh, time is, is going. I, let, let me get. Let me say just one more thing. This is really serious. You need to be a revolutionary. Why aren't you rebelling? Why aren't you? The oceans. There's been a warning. The science, the Journal of Science, or the Scientific Journal has stated that a scientist's estimates on the rate of ocean warming were greatly underestimated and that the oceans of the planet Earth are warming 40% faster than predicted. And I know ocean warming ain't just about, you know, you get to wear your little two-piece bikini and, your, and, and the men, you can wear your mankini thong, mankini to, to the beach or the lake shore. What this means is <clears throat> there will be higher rates of, of diseases for, for marine life and people who live along the coast. Um, there will be greater ecosystem disruption, species, the coral reef systems, the Arctic oceans and the Arctic ecosystems for marine fish and marine mammals and, 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 and uh, marine, uh, you know, the biggest for forest, the most plant life is in the water. There's more plant life in the water than in on land. The phytoplankton are the basis of the, the food system and the, the Earth's atmosphere, oxygen. So they, they have the just even we could be have much lower oxygen rate. Um, migration routes and breeding habitat for marine mammals and marine reptiles and marine fish are also greatly disrupted. Basically, human extinction as a byproduct of marine ecosystem collapse. This is a water planet, what happens in the water, and also the carbon sink, the capacity for the oceans to absorb heat. 94% of the uh, heat from the sun gets absorbed by the ocean, not by the land, and as the oceans become heat emitters, carbon emitters, as opposed to carbon absorbers, that will make life inhospitable for complex life forms, human life forms, it goes on. And the only way to deal with this is to reduce carbon output. The only way to reduce carbon output significantly is to do away with industrial capitalism and, and militarization of the planet, i.e. remove white domination, white economy, white mentality from the earth, man versus nature, man conquest of nature, and for human beings to return to living within ecological limits. But I digress. Moving the blood clot on. I want to talk about Willie Lynch. I should take a little break. But I ain't even got time to stop. I ain't got time. Ain't never no time. <sighs> Willie Lynch. I had just got into some big fight. Black folks, man, if you think, let me tell you something. I thought talking about Jesus Christ and dispelling the myth of Jesus Christ would get me in trouble with black folks. I thought dispelling the myth of the prophet Muhammad would get me in trouble with black folks. I thought talking about the most honorable Elijah Muhammad or most honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan would get me in trouble with black folks. I thought talking about these icons, talking about black elite, talking about G Beyonce, talking about Jay-Z, talking about all these black, talking about King LeBron James, our Lord and Savior, King James have gotten me, nothing has gotten me in more trouble on social media than me saying critical, unfavorable things about Willie Lynch. Black people have so much emotional, ideological, pseudo-historical, pseudo-intellectual investment in Willie Lynch, and I'm surprised. I live in a bubble. 
If it was up in my worldview, every black person is an atheist, a vegan, a revolutionary, or at least fundamentally a right wing, a left wing radical progressive, if not full on revolutionary. Those are the kind of people I sit around, I crack jokes with, I had, I eat dinner with, I hang, I just kick it with. So I, I, I get into these bubbles. And I try to venture out. I want to be amongst the people. I want to be a man of, five, for, and by, and of the people. So I try to get out amongst the people. And then I get out amongst the people, and then I find out things I didn't know. That's why I got to stay amongst the people. I got to start showing up. I got to come out here and step in the name of love with y'all at the parties. I don't like doing that. I don't want to step in the name of love. Stupid ass song by a pedophile. But if that's what y'all doing, I guess I got to get out more. Because I don't know what's going on with black people. I don't know what the hell kind of stuff y'all be on but then it ain't even me it's not my fault that i'm not of the, amongst the people it's the people don't want me there they think i ruined their party i ruined the get together i keep coming with the with the with you know uh diallo downer as 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 black star used to call me the the the, the grinch of pan-africanism i just bring everybody down but hey i i'll claim it I'll, I'll own it, like Trump stupidly owned the shutdown. Call it the Trump shutdown, call it the Diallo bring down. I, I will slaughter all your sacred cows. Because I just want to keep it real. I try to keep it hunted. Y'all talk about keeping it hunted, but then when somebody come with a hundred, y'all want to knock me down to 75, 80 cents. Now I'm going to keep it a hundred. I was thoroughly disgusted. For all these black people coming in, Willie Lynch matters, Willie Lynch syndrome, Willie Lynch, Willie, Willie, Willie. I'm like, damn, seriously? Now, here's my issues with Willie Lynch. Let's just break it on down. First of all, one of the main myths about Willie Lynch is that the term lynching and the practice of lynching came from Willie Lynch. First of all, the first thing about Willie Lynch is that Willie Lynch was actually a person. Willie Lynch never existed. This person was not a person. He was said to be a, uh, a plantation owner, a slave master, and a slave wrangler from the British West Indies. None of that is true. Willie Lynch did not exist. So put him up there. But we like fictional. We like to, to, to worship or look up to or, 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 or beef with. We'd rather fight with reptilian Illuminati overlords than fight the scumbags who are truly exploiting us and our children. We like to prop up these Lex Luthor fake figures instead of fighting the real oppressors, instead of studying the real history. That really pisses me off. But Willie Lynch didn't exist. And then they say that the term in practice of lynching was conceived of and named after Willie Lynch. When Will lynching, the, the term lynching, came was founded by a man who was born more than 30 years after supposedly Willie Lynch gave his famous speech. Let's make a slave. Right? And so, more than three decades after, and it was actually a uh, Virginia magistrate by the name of William Lynch, who was a real person, who we can trace back to. And in fact, the first victims of lynching in America, lynching wasn't, con wasn't really invented for blacks, it was actually Welsh ethnic minorities, white on white. Like I said, everything white people did to us, they perfected on themselves first. And that we have to understand that I can't drive that home enough. It didn't start with us and it's not gonna end with us. It started with white folks and it will end with them. So white people were more likely to, to, to lynch Irish and Dutch and white ethnic or religious minorities than they were to lynch blacks. Blacks didn't become the main target of lynching until the, it, it, it started in the 1780s, actually. The term came about. The practice goes all the way back to the Roman Empire. They used to call it crucifixion. So the white folks was doing lynching. They didn't call it lynching, but they were engaging in ritual murder, mutilation, unjust murder, mutilation, mob murder, and mutilation. They were doing that. That's been a cornerstone of their culture before they ever left Europe. But we want to act like it's all about us and it centers on us. No. Anybody can get it. We getting it now, but as Dick Gregory said, somebody got to be the nigga. The white man has always had a nigga. The white man can't exist without a nigga, even if they have to turn their own wives and children into the nigga. 
and you don't believe that, th that the white woman had and white children had to play the nigger role, go back to the early industrial revolution and look at how they treated their own children, throwing them in copper mines and coal mines and putting them in, 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 in the mills. Little eight, nine-year-old white kids losing their fingers, getting crippled and, and, and mutilated. In old Europe, early industrial Europe, they, they, they put a little white boy in debtor's prison, white children, hanging white children for stealing a, a, a lump of moldy bread and shilling. You go look at Oliver Twist. Y'all like the fiction more than the real history anyway. This ain't no joke. It ain't never been a joke, to quote Del Jones. And the white woman, you talk about lynching, burning alive, hanging, stripping, cutting, and, and mutilating their genitals. They, and the white people would take red, red pokers, metal pokers, and put them in the fly, fire until they're flaming red and stick them in the vaginas or anuses of women. Didn't call it lynching, though. They called it exercising demons. So this, is, this ain't us. This ain't about us. We were just brought into the fold. And we need to get out of the fold, but it ain't about us. It didn't start with us. But the term lynching started with, uh, in, 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 uh, in what, the, the 1880s? The 1780s. I'm sorry. The 1780s. They started lynching us after the emancipation. And the post-Reconstruction era is when lynching became targeted at black folks. Prior to that, the Welch, a Welch white man would be more likely to be lynched than a black man. Go look it up. So, and it ain't named after Willie Lynch. The man who the lynching was named after was born 30 years after Willie Lynch. And here's another thing about Willie Lynch. Willie Lynch, in the, in the old fake speech... The fake Willie Lynch in a fake speech said that his techniques would last 300 years. He gave the speech in 1712. So we were free from Willie Lynch in 2012. So that alone, even if you believed everything about Willie Lynch was fact, everything about Willie Lynch was dyed in the wool, then we still, we free. It's over. In 2012, we seven years outside of Willie Lynch. But y'all still won't let that cracker die. Now let's tell you, what did Willie Lynch say? Willie Lynch said some pretty basic backyard stuff. Wasn't nothing too complex. Willie Lynch said, fear, envy, and distrust equals control. You go amongst the slaves and you breed fear, envy, and distrust, slave to slave. You would make, and you would focus on fear, envy, and distrust, and you recognize the differences. So you look at age differences. You have the old go against the young. You look at color differences. You have the darker skin and the lighter skin and color variations. You highlight that. Uh, size. You take the big slaves. Yeah, he said size. The big slaves against the little slaves. You know, the well-fed slaves versus the skinny, underfed, malnourished slaves. You, you beat them together. Intelligence. You take the intelligent slaves and you, you pit them against the stupid slaves. It's pretty basic stuff. It doesn't really make much sense, but let's pretend. Since it's all pretend anyway. Black people really think this is our problem. You go to any black gathering. If you're white, just ask your black friend. But if you're black, go to any black gathering and sit amongst our people. And the first time there's any level of discontent, anytime there's any argument in a debate, now we're talking about the fate of the race. And black people expect to be able to sit down and have smooth sailing, no argument, no dis uh, disruption. And as soon as somebody says, well, I disagree with what's being proposed. Oh, this Willie Lynch. We can't have nothing. We ain't going to never do nothing, be nothing because of Willie Lynch. It's the Willie Lynch syndrome. That's why we can't get along. It's because of Willie Lynch. Back in 1712, a dead man who never existed from 1712 is disrupting a meeting in the south side of Chicago in 2018, 2019. This is the kind of nonsense we get up to. We fearing, we're fearing specters, ghosts, myths. The Willie Lynch is literally a boogeyman. And we got all these black authors, all these hustlers and shysters writing books talking about the Willie Lynch syndrome, the legacy of Willie Lynch. Right? Now, this is kind of stupid because when you look at, and I brought some books here. I only bought three. 
Because I... You got book, Cut Your Stammering Tongue, Black Theology and the Slave Narratives that tell you you don't need no lying ass Willie Lynch. People would rather listen to a ghost, to a liar, to a mythological figure, figure like Lily Lynch than to listen to the very words of our ancestors. This non-existent white boogeyman is more relevant to us and you hear black folks quote Willie Lynch more than they quote Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, uh, 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 what's her name? Um, Harriet Tubman, black folks that were written, recorded, and even got black people on phonographs, on, on, on recordings, analog recordings saying this is what they did to us. This is why they did it. These were the outcomes. This is how we responded. Some real history. We'd rather have the mythological Willie Lynch. And if they were so damn good, if, if Willie Lynch was so right, how come they got to be free? Slave guerrilla warfare, militant abolitionism, black soldiers and sailors in the Civil War, freedom organization, reconstruction in Mississippi. Whole book of ongoing black resistance. Black people have been fighting these crackers and fighting our oppression since day one. There hasn't been a day since we got on, since Plymouth Rock fell on us, as Denzel Washington, as Malcolm X stated. When Plymouth, the moment Plymouth Rock had fell on us, not only have black people been fighting, white people been scared to freaking death of us. In no other country, white country, the British had no tradition of arming the citizens. You go to Great Britain right now, you can't get no damn gun. The Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, had nothing to do with nothing but fighting slaves. They, every white, able-bodied white man was required to have a gun because they were scared of us. Now, if we were so busy fighting, uh, so busy fighting each other and divided along age, color, size, intelligence, gender, and black people couldn't get along because of Willie Lynch, why the hell did they have to ingrain armed resistance to black rebellion in the goddamn U.S. Constitution? This ain't about fighting government tyranny. White folks got all these guns and they ain't never raised rose up not once against government tyranny. Not one time. Tell me when white people took up arms against government tyranny. The only time white people get mobilized is when some white elite comes and hurts them like the white cattle that they are. And don't get mad at me, white folks. I encourage y'all to take up guns against government tyranny. I support you in doing that. Go on and get to it, Baba, Bubba, Hoss, Becky. Susan, get to it. Take up your guns against government tyranny. And if you don't know where the government tyranny are, and you don't know who the tyrants are, I got lists. I got names and addresses for you, white folks, the moment y'all ready to rise up. But you know, as well as I know, that's not why white folks got guns. They got guns because the Willie Lynch syndrome never worked. The Willie Lynch syndrome is not real. The Willie Lynch syndrome is fiction. Runaway slaves, rebels of the plantation. One of our greatest historians, John Hope Franklin. We got black people that could tell us the real story. That's my biggest problem with this Willie Lynch. Why are we messing around with fiction when we got the recorded facts? When we got the recorded history, why are we messing with the fiction? And the fiction is not even accurate. You go back and look at the slave resistance. This stuff didn't work. I'm not saying it didn't happen. I'm saying it didn't work. It is not why we have problems now. It is not what our problem was back then. Now, one thing the white man did use was unrelenting violence. One thing the white man did use was physical mutilation. One of the main re ways that they stopped slaves from running away was not by telling an old slave not to trust a young slave. Not telling the darky slaves not to trust the high yellow slaves. Not by telling the black men to not trust the black woman. No, the way they stopped us from running away is putting big metal bells around our neck, locking shackles on us, by amputating our big toes on both foot so we can shuffle through the cotton fields and pick cotton. We can dig trenches. We can do the work, but we can't run and we can't go for long distances. The one way they would hold us hostage is every time we went out to the fields, they'd gather up all the black little children and black infants and say, if you don't make it back here by the, by the, by the nighttime bell, we're going to slit the throats of these little black babies. That's what they did to control us through unrelenting violence, through ongoing atrocities. It wasn't no little mind games. 
We weren't in slavery in this country because black men didn't trust black women and black women didn't trust black men because old black folks couldn't trust young black folks. It was the unrelenting atrocities of the white people committed against us through unrelenting, unseen violence. It wasn't nothing sophisticated. It wasn't Willie Lynch coming to play mind games and manipulation with us. And it's disrespectful to the suffering of our ancestors to allow this false history to be perpetuated generation after damn generation. It's disgusting. But it hasn't been generation after generation. Because if you were a black person in 1920, 1930, 1940, 1950, even 1960, you didn't know nothing about Willie Lynch. Because that myth wasn't even published then. It wasn't until the 1970s. They say it was written in the late 1960s, but it didn't become prominent until the late 1970s or mid-1970s. So for the most part of our history, we didn't have to deal with this stupid myth, but now this is getting more legs than the actual scholarship. And I keep hearing, Willie Lynch this, Willie Lynch that. And then when I'm like, this is fake, people, oh, it's fake, but it's real. Just because it's not real don't mean it ain't relevant. Yeah, it, just because it's real doesn't mean it's not relevant, but the relevancy is what you miss. Because what's really relevant is about this is how anti-intellectual you are. That's what's relevant. Not that it shows what happened to black people, but it shows what's wrong with you. You'd rather deal with mythology and mythological boogeymen than deal with the real oppressors and the real documented history. You're more comfortable with a, myth, a, a, a convenient mythology. But I'll move on because the, the Uncle Tom, some real sick Negro wrote this. And let me show you why, because I went back and read the whole damn Willie Lynch letter last night. I couldn't find my copy of it. I had a copy of the Willie Lynch letter. The one with the yellow, the, it's black and white image of a white man whipping slaves and the yellow and red, red. I don't know where it was. I asked my wife 10 times and she told me to stop asking. Her. I'm like, where's my Willie Lynch letter? She said, I don't know. I ain't seen it. Hey, Eric, where's my Willie Lynch? And I know the way my life works out, the moment I get home, I'm going to be doing something else and there's going to be the Willie Lynch. But I couldn't find it. But anyway, it's all over the internet. Y'all won't let this BS die. So fortunately, unfortunately, I didn't have trouble finding the, it online. I read it word for word. And I read this and I'm like, yo, this is some right wing ultra conservative. This is some Umar stuff. Because then it goes on to say, Willie Lynch tells the slave master, ultimately, to break the slave, you have to break the black woman. You have to breed the black woman and break the black woman. And if you could break the black woman, if you could manipulate the black woman, if you could bring the black woman over to your side, then she will break down the black man. She will raise up broken boys. And when she goes to breed with a nigger, she will break that nigger and make that nigger bow to your will. And that's the same stuff the Umars and the Tariqs are saying right now. It's the black woman's fault. The black woman is the white man's asset. The black woman is the white man's ally. And I'm like, damn. And so for the black man to get free, essentially, if you follow the Willie Lynch rule, the black man has to get dominance over the black woman and wrest dominance of the black woman away from the white man. This is some old Judeo-Christian type mess. Go back and read it. The second part. The first part is where he talks about the fear, envy, distrust, and division. The second part is where he talks about he targets in on the black woman. And he's like, you make the black woman assertive, essentially, and you, which will render the black man passive. This is sexist as hell. And we already know now that it was written by a black man, and now people are saying that, well, this black man tried to do a benevolent thing to highlight the black people's problem, to kind of consolidate this, this knowledge. And let me tell you something about historical cliff notes, about breaking it down for black people. Amos Wilson, the book that was published, that he was working on to the, literally the day he died, that was published uh, uh, a few years after his passing. He said that as he was writing the book, the book was essentially taking him, leading him, guiding him, blueprint for black power. He said first the book was going to be, you know, basically a speech or a pamphlet. Then he said it was a small book, maybe uh, 85 pages. And then it got to 100 pages. Then it got to 200 pages. Then it got to 300 pages. And when people would be asking him, yo, Dr. Wilson, what's up with the new book? And he was like, man, I'm up to 275 pages and I'm, you know, I'm still working. I'm still developing. And they were like, man, don't nobody want to read that book. That book going to be 300 pages, 400 pages. Dr. Wilson, ain't nobody going to read all that. And Dr. Wilson said that in writing Blueprint for Black Power, he's on tape stating that, 
Black people really think that our issues and we as a people and our issues and our history aren't really deserving of such real in-depth study. That when you're dealing with something black, when you're dealing with an issue that deals with black people, you should be able to break it down in a letter, in a pamphlet. Now, for the Jewish Holocaust that only lasted, I'm sorry, the German Holocaust that only lasted what? Less than a decade. That only killed uh, on the record, 6 million Jews, 20 million Slavs, but we don't count the Slavs because they're not fully white. Go back and listen to my uh, tape on white unity, the myth of white unity and how white, all these white, internal white divisions. Now, they don't count the Slavs. They never talk about 20 million Slavs. They just talk about the 6 million Jews. But that's on them. That's, the, if that's how they want to record their history. Go for it. But what I'm saying, there's entire libraries dedicated to that in my own home. Hitler's willing executioner, the drowned and the saved, all quiet on the Western Front. There are volumes and volumes and volumes of books dating from, from the First World War to the Second World War and the Jews and what happened to them. Not even 50 years of history. And there are literally billions of pages written of journals, of research, of analysis. But we think we can understand the plight of our ancestors over hundreds of years of an ongoing genocide in a ladder. Explains it all. Because black folks, we not that important. We spiritual people. We intuitive. He also, Amy said Wilson had a lot to say about this whole nonsense of us being spiritual and intuitive, which is BS. I said, yeah, I said. Quote and wise intelligence. I said, I said it, I said it. I might have to play that. But he cursed too much. I can't play it on the air. But I said it too, wise. So he found out that black people don't really think we're worthy of in-depth research, of reading the volumes. We'd rather have a fictional comic book villain than talk about the real oppressors, to talk about the real psychology and the fallout of actual historical events. We need a cliff notes. But he talks about miscegenation, told the slave master, like the white man had to be told the white man was raping black women, not because he's a rapist. Not because he lusted after black women. At first he calls us subhuman primates and then he's going to go and procreate with us. What does that make you? But he did it as a strategic thing to disrupt us, to create the color divide. And then the final thing was ban African languages. Don't let them speak their mother tongue. So the Willie Lynch letter sets up nicely this whole black Puritan, black macho, black sexist, Afro-sexist attitude that the woman, our weak women, is used against us. In order to defeat our male uh, enemies, we have to get control of our women. So we will spend the next three generations never confronting the systems and institutions of global white domination and capitalism because we got to spend all this time bringing the bl white black women under control control that woman and we expend more energy then which feeds into that nonsense about the divisions between sex, age, size, color, and intelligence. So it's a self-fulfilling loop if you buy into this BS. But if you realize it's this BS, you don't get caught up into trying to fix false problems. We know how do white people control us? They have superior military power, they control the, the resources, and they control the institutions. And instead of developing uh, guerrilla fighting forces, subversive asymmetrical warfare tactics so that a, a lesser armed people like the Vietnamese, the Viet Cong, like the uh, Iraqi insurgents, like the, the uh, Afghani freedom fighters, you don't need superior arms. You know what defeats superior arms, superior tactics, and a greater dedication and understanding of what you're fighting for will take out the, uh, a superior fighting force. But instead of developing that, Instead of resting control of our resources or de developing alternative resources, instead of building alternative institutions or resting control of institutions, we spend time fighting, pretending like our problem is old people don't get along with young people. No old people ever get along with young people. That's just every generation, every manifesto, it's always that. That is healthy. It's necessary. I'd hate, I'd hate to get along with my son. His music sucks, his fashion sucks, his room is a mess, his hair is a mess. 
And everything I'm saying about him, my father wasn't, daddy wasn't there, raised by my grandma, but my uncles and everybody said the same thing about me. Oh, I missed the call. I'm sorry, caller. Please call back. I just saw. But call back, caller. I'll get you on the air. Um, what did I, where was it? Oh, yeah, my uncles who raised me. Something wrong with this phone. Bro Diallo Show, caller, you're on the air. State your name. Alias and location, or alias and location. Good morning, Diallo. Hey, hey, sis, straight out of St. Louis. How you doing? Oh, this is your first time calling, right? No, it's been a minute. It's been a minute. Yeah, I see. You stay away, and I forget about you. You got to, you got to stay on deck. I listen, but I don't too much uh, call in. But I did want to call you and correct something you said earlier. You said this is the first time. Oh, this is the worst that you've been attacked, talking about Willie Lynch. Huh. You know, about a week ago, the Yahweh Rangers came at you pretty hard, remember? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I, I, but here's the thing. When I'm attacked by the Yahweh Rangers, a.k.a. the black Hebrew Israelites, that's just a sect. That's a small, isolated sect. When I'm attacked by, when I go at Willie Lynch, you got black Christians, black atheists, black conscious, black Uncle Tom. You got black people from all walks of life, not just some cult. So it is a bigger, uh, it's a bigger range of attack. Okay, okay, I see. I definitely understand that. It's definitely coming from all over. Um, as far as the Willie Lynch thing goes, uh, I read, you know, back in high school, uh, like most people read it, you know, I didn't put too much stock in it. Um, I didn't really care if it was written by somebody who, you know, was a person named Willie Lynch, or I, I just didn't, because it wasn't anything that was going to, you know what I'm saying, okay, you know, these are the issues we have. It wasn't going to fix anything, you know, but highlighting our issues. So I never, too, personally, I never took too much stock in it. I never, and I never knew, like you, I guess I've been in some bubble. I never thought that new black people just really like, you know, um, center their ideology around our cultural issues by this work of fiction. You know, it's kind of like the Bible. You know what I'm saying? Okay, there's a grain of truth in it every now and again, but all in all, it's a bullshit. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a, it's a bitch. You're going to get me kicked so, off the air. You know, I just never really understood or knew that people really, you know, got uh -huh. their um, uh, black ideology or their black thought process around this, you know, was around this uh, work. But um, I'm, I'm thinking about what you're saying about how they're talking about black women got to dominate them and all that and, you know, got to keep the black woman down. That definitely sounds like some Umarian type, you know, um, you know, um, um, you know, I can't, I got to compete with the white man. The only way I can do it is dominate my mom. So that definitely sounds like something I'm definitely going to miss now. Right, yeah. I, I had read the letter and dismissed it long ago because, you know, St. Louis is one of the schools. The Washington University of uh, Washington in St. Louis is one of the uh, histor history departments that came out with, with debunking the Willie Lynch, the authenticity of the letter, the, the existence of Willie Lynch, and the, the, the historical impacts of it. It just, br just blew, blew it all up. It came out of uh, St. Louis. It wasn't just St. Louis, but some black scholars at the University of Washington in St. Louis were one of the main first people to come out debunking this nonsense. More Like 20 years ago. Yeah. I'm so happy you called, but I, I still going to have to say Willie Lynch w w wins out over Yahweh. <laughs> he got, Willie Lynch got more black folks rapping for him than Yahweh does at this point, but it's an ongoing horse race. See, yeah. yeah, they was mad. They still mad. <laughs> Stay mad. <laughs> I'm so happy to hear from you, sister. Please continue to call back. All right, peace. So, yeah, I'm glad. To, yeah, a lot of black people read it and dismiss it, but I challenge you, just go online, go on your social media and say, Willie Lynch is fake. The Willie Lynch syndrome is a myth and see how black people come at your neck or go to any black gathering and wait for some type of disagreement, which is necessary. Iron sharpens iron. You ever heard that? I might have to play that song if I get time. Now I got I really want to hear it. I might, if I don't have time to play it, which it don't look like, but I'll play it on the way home. Iron sharpens iron. So sometimes you got to cling together. You got to conflict in order to strengthen yourself, to refine your processes. But then they said ban African languages. So you got black people running around, we have to learn to speak African languages, we have to wear African clothes, or we're not going to be free. 
Now, I have nothing against speaking African languages and wearing African clothes. More of it, it's not even African clothing. It's African costumes a lot of times. But here's the thing. Africa, the continent of Africa, was colonized. And let me tell you, they were in chattel slavery from Kenya to Nigeria, from Algeria to South Africa, from pit to post. They were all enslaved. They were raped. They were corralled. They were subjected to ethnic cleansing, genocidal campaigns. They were forced to labor for free. They were starved to death. They had their resources stolen. They were enslaved on now. Africans like to, some uneducated Africans, some Uncle Tom Africans like to pretend like there was this great, and just like Uncle Tom, black folks of, of the African diaspora, the descendants of slaves, they like to pretend that our experience, like the white people from Great Britain in Africa and the white people from Great Britain in America were so different and they treated us different and therefore we're different people. <laughs> okay, whatever. But they spoke African languages. They wore African clothes. They knew their lineage. They weren't broke off from their history, but they were still enslaved. I'm not saying don't know your history. Lord knows I say know your history. But don't pretend like, oh, I know my history, and then the white man's going to crumble at your feet because you know your history or you speak an African language. Alafia. Oh, he said Alafia. Oh, I'm losing my power. Oh, I'm melting. We need revolution. Ain't no way around it. Ain't no shortcut through it. And revolution is an intellectual scholarly endeavor. It is intellectual. It's more intellectual than it is military or physical or even political. The core of revolution is intellectual. But if you want to understand the mind, the psychology, this is only three books. There are several other books that I could have brought. The Falsification of African Consciousness, Eurocentric History, Psychiatry, and the Politics of White Supremacy. You want to understand white folks, you ain't got to, what? Uh, decolonizing the African Mind by Chinwezu. We ain't got to go wretched of the earth, another brilliant black psychologist. We, ain't, we don't need Willie Lynch. But you know, these got hundreds of pages. This ain't no four-page, five-page letter. This is some real scholarship because we deserve, we need to be studied. We are a complex, dynamic, and the oldest people in the world. You're not going to understand what we've been through, and you're not going to understand why we are where we are or how we come out of where we come out of unless you do your research. And if you ain't down for research, you ain't down for liberation. We need statecraft. Yeah, we need our own bureaucracy. We need to develop and refine our ideology, ideological processes. You, it ain't just, oh, I don't like slavery, therefore I'm a freedom fighter. No, you're just a discontent slave. You don't become a freedom fighter. You don't become a, a revolutionary until you do your research, until you have a real basic radical understanding. And radical ain't about being crazy, breathing, and foaming at the mouth. Radical is understanding the seed, the root, the fundamental elements of a thing. That's when you become a radical. You can't be a radical without being a scholar. You can be militant. Like I said, you can be as discontent as you want to be, but you are no threat to the system. Like I tell y'all all the time, Malcolm X went around the country during the height of segregation talking about the white man is the devil, the fall of America. They didn't give a damn. But the moment Malcolm X started to get out of that cult, the moment Malcolm X started to reject that cult and say, listen, I'm going to do some real study. When he sat at the foot, when he sat across from Kwame Nkrumah, when he sat across from uh, Dr. John Henry Carr, and he was like, oh, religion, put that in the closet. I'm a pan-African. And when he started the OAAU, the OAAU that just had a dozen members was more of a threat to the, the global power structure than all the angry militant white devil want to kill whitey militants in the world. And that's when they had to kill him. Not because he said the white man was a devil and that irre So I'm sick of dealing with all these discontent slaves. I need some conscious Africans. And you want to understand who the real oppressor is. You got the Iceman's inheritance. You want to find out somebody that told on white people that exposed white folks and their methodology? Forget about Willie Lynch. Go study Michael Bradley. And also, Willie Lynch didn't work. If Willie Lynch worked, they wouldn't have had to come with COINTELPRO. They wouldn't have had to have a, a decolonization. They wouldn't have had to implement a new world order. And the reason they had to do a new world order is because the old world order didn't work. You wouldn't have all this resistance. 
You wouldn't have to have all these agencies and all this surveillance and all this subversions, all these political prisoners, all these assassinations, all these great African freedom fighters in exile from Asada Shakur, Pete O'Neill, all these great Africans in prison. If Willie Lynch worked, they wouldn't have to still be fighting us and suppressing us and attacking us. It didn't work. It didn't happen, but it didn't work. Not the way you think it is. And we do have some cultural, psychological, material repercussions from slavery. But that requires real dissection, real analysis, and real systematic repair. We are not at fault. We are not to blame for what happened to us, but we are responsible for fixing what happened. You even have, and this is not one of my favorite books, but this is just one of many, how capitalism underdeveloped America. This ain't about no gains. I hate to go to Marx to y'all, but this is a materialist thing. And I'll tell you this, white people spent more time in slavery than African people. Did they get willy lynched? Huh? The roots of your average white friend, if they were honestly look at their history from indentured service to the serfdom and peasants of Europe, if they trace their history back, you'll find the average white person has a deeper history in bondage and slavery than the average African. And does Willie Lynch stop them? And then you talk about how we're divided? White folks, how many civil wars and internal conflicts, how many internal divisions between white people are there? If these internal divisions have prevented us from taking power, from being sovereign, from being liberated, then if, if being internally divided and having internal hatred and hostilities and fighting each other was the real source of oppression, white people would be the most oppressed people on the face of the earth. But they aren't, because this is about power. You hear me? This is about power. This is about systematic organizing. We need organization. Our real problem is that we don't fight for the right things. We keep fighting for integration. We keep setting their yardsticks as our standard, amassing their fiat relating to each other and relating to the ecosystems we dwell in the same way they do. We seek equality with them instead of to unseat them, to subvert them. That is our problem. And we've been very successful at securing resources and equality and rising up black people in the United States are some of the richest black people on the planet. But we don't feel rich because we got the toxic wealth of our oppressor. Seeking equality with your oppressor makes you equal to your oppressor. So our real problem is not that we got some ghost called Willie Lynch and even that post-traumatic slave syndrome nonsense. Because they you ain't got to go back then. We are suffering from a lack of revolutionary organizing. And these people that talk that Willie Lynch stuff, you notice they're not calling for revolution. They're trying to internalize and victim blame and got want us working on some internal nonsense. Want us to tell black woman, uh, black woman is because your well, black woman's relationship with the white man is why we oppress. Got us one on us fighting each other because they prefer to fight amongst ourselves because they fear our true enemies or they are prophets or benefactors of our true enemies. Don't come to me with that Willie Lynch. Come to me with some real scholarship. Come to me with the real uh, research. Come to me with the slave narratives and what our ancestors actually said. It's time for us to put that mythology to bed. You know, they have this thing called Holocaust denial. And in parts of Europe, Germany, France, you can go to jail for distorting the history of the Holocaust, for denying the history and the true history of the Holocaust. You can be incarcerated. You can lose your job here in the United States being a Holocaust denier. But you can be a slave denier. You can distort the history and what really happened to our slaves. You can promote some mythology, mythological fiction fiction over the true reality of our ancestors and you become a black leader. We got to fix this. Bro Diallo Show, please subscribe to the YouTube page. If you're listening now, don't take, just click the button, click the, I, I don't like trying to hustle clicks, 
but this is this is the nature of the, of, of of the industry if i'm going to stay on the air i got to try to hustle clicks share the show uh subscribe to the youtube i'm going to stop broadcasting on facebook pretty soon so if you want to see the live video broadcasting you're going to have to be on youtube anyway so so because i'm gonna have to stop messing with facebook so heavy they they just they own me tumblr too i thought tumblr, they tumblr snatch but anyway yeah you know the internet is going on lockdown so i need your support go to patreon become a supporter if you can share the the content with your friends allies lovers enemies mistresses and mistress Let's get the word out. Progressive Independent Media, Bro Diallo Show, Q4 Radio. I'll be back Monday morning. I'm going to bring back the Q&A with Bro Diallo over the weekend. Uh, we're having an African World Coalition organizational meeting and a Nubians for Literacy National Book Club meeting this Sunday at the Polsky Exchange. Again, you can find that on, on uh, the Nubians for Literacy group and the African World Order page um, or my Facebook page. I've shared links to all of that. Uh, Q4 Radio. Q4.org, find out about the Q4 uh, studio, you can come here, have your events, and, and big up, you know, so much going on. Uh, the TuneIn app, iTunes Radio, AM 1680, all of that. I'll see y'all Monday morning, Bro Diallo, down with Willie Lynch, up with Real Research, up with Real History. Iron sharpens iron. Culture. <laughs>